never had a multi-GPU setup, chances are the idea has tickled your fancy. After all, multi-GPU setups like SLI seem like the best way to get the next-gen graphics today, right? You're getting twice the performance that a current-gen CPU can offer, right? Well, things aren't actually that straightforward. But before we can answer whether SLI is worth it for you, let's take a look at what exactly this technology is and how it came to be. SLI is NVIDIA's proprietary parallel processing technology that allows multiple GPUs to link up and operate within the same PC. Now, this is done via an SLI bridge that facilitates data transfer between the two units. The acronym SLI stands for Scalable Link Interface. However, while scalability has always been at the core of SLI, this acronym didn't always stand for Scalable Link Interface. In fact, it didn't always belong to NVIDIA either. In order to recount the history of SLI, we need to take you back to the last millennium. More precisely to an era dominated by dial-up connections, bulky monitors and pagers, back when life was unrecognizably different. This era is also known as the 90s, or just a couple of decades ago. Back then, NVIDIA and ATI, which you could think of as AMD, had another competitor in the 3D graphics processing business, the hugely popular 3DFX. It was this GPU manufacturer that came up with the idea of SLI. In 1998, 3DFX launched a graphics accelerator line known as Voodoo 2. It was the first unit to incorporate three GPUs on one card by means of their proprietary scanline interface or SLI. Thanks to this, the Voodoo 2 could run games in an unprecedented 1024 by 768 resolution. Can you imagine a time when these were insane graphics and 800 by 600 was the norm? In any case, Voodoo 2 was the first consumer-oriented graphics card that was dedicated to gaming, and it helped set the tone for the rich and vibrant gaming hardware scene that we know and love today. However, despite an aggressive marketing push with the promise of doubling the PC's processing power, SLI didn't quite take over the market, and it's easy to see why. You had to sacrifice many PCI slots in order to accommodate a Voodoo 2 unit. More importantly, the rendering process was not without its fair share of hiccups, resulting in some unsightly display artifacts such as incomplete frames and tearing. The merger with the STB systems also didn't help, and soon enough, 3DFX was no longer able to compete with the GeForce and Radeon line of cards that were only getting better and better. Soon enough, Nvidia acquired 3DFX, and with it, as SLI, but the GPU giant would let the technology lay dormant for a couple of years, returning to it only in 2004 when it was relaunched as a scalable link interface that we know today, geared towards use in PCI Express slots rather than the dated PCI slots. And the rest, as they say, is history. Or at least it was, for a while. SLI went on to enjoy massive success, but somewhere along the line this trend stopped and it's been on the decline ever since. In order to understand why this happened, we need to take a look at the features and some of the specifics behind the way SLI operates. So let's take a look at how exactly SLI functions. This technology operates on a master and slave basis where one card acts as the final port of call responsible for sending the finalized 3D rendered graphics to the display. The technology allows for two, three, or four GPUs to be linked up at once. This is what we know as two-way, three-way, and four-way SLI. An SLI bridge is used so that GPUs can circumvent the motherboard's chipset altogether and communicate directly amongst each other. This way, the GPU GPUs don't need to compete for bandwidth. As of right now, there are four types of SLI bridges. The first is the standard SLI bridge equipped with 1 GB per second transfer bandwidth and a 400 MHz pixel clock. It was incredible when it launched, but nowadays it falls a bit flat, with 1080p being the most optimal resolution for this bridge. Then there's SLI LED, which is mostly similar to the standard version, except that it has a 540 MHz pixel clock and of course some slick RGB LED lighting for extra flavor. Unlike the original bridge, however, the SLI LED can handle and is better best used for 4K. The third incarnation of this technology is the SLI HB bridge. The HB stands for high bandwidth, and with a 650 MHz pixel clock and transfer rates nearing 2 GB per second, it certainly lived up to the name. If you're looking to run games in 5K, then this is the bridge for you. It's the most common bridge, but it's not the most recent one anymore. That honor goes to the NVLink bridge, the most recent format that was made specifically for use with the new RTX line of GPUs. It's 
actually capable of speeds up to 100 gigabytes per second, which is just mind-boggling. Although at the moment, it's still best used for 5K just like HP. Okay, so now that we know what types of SLI bridges there are, let's look at the way they work. It all comes down to splitting the rendering tasks equally among the GPUs. In most cases, one card will focus on one set of frames while the other will focus on the other set, but the method through which this is achieved can vary. Currently, there are three SLI modes. The first one is split frame rendering. When using split frame rendering, the workload is broken down horizontally in chunks based on a 3D complexity. These chunks are then assigned to the GPUs proportionally. Then there's alternate frame rendering. This is when each GPU renders a single frame in succession. So if you've got two GPUs, the first GPU would render the first frame, the second GPU would render the second frame, then the first GPU would render the third frame, and so on, until the heat death of the universe. This, of course, results in higher frame rates. And finally, there's SLI anti-aliasing, which increases the anti-aliasing capabilities of the GPU twofold by sharing the processing task equally amongst the GPUs. If you've ever come across SLI by 8 or SLI by 16 in the graphics menu of a game and wondered what it meant, well, now you know. The visual quality is strikingly better when using SLI anti-aliasing, but the performance can be taxing, even for multiple GPUs. Okay, so now that we've gone through all of the technical stuff, there's only one more thing we need to cover before understanding why SLI is on the decline. It's the most important factor, but it's also very simple. SLI isn't a magic fix that will boost the frame rate in any games. Developers need to add an extra layer of code for their games if they wanted to support SLI. Once that's done in a satisfactory manner, Nvidia publishes an SLI profile for that particular game, which preps the GPU so that things can actually work the way they're supposed to. From here, it's easy to infer why SLI isn't doing as well as it used to. During its heyday, you needed SLI if you wanted to crank the graphics in a video games to 11. This was back in the days of GTX 600, 700, and 900 series, and as you can imagine, there was a real demand for this. Of course, gamers wanted to game on ultra settings, and this couldn't really be achieved by any other means, so developers made sure to enable as many games as possible with SLI support. It helped that even the more affordable GPUs got SLI support, so at the time, SLI SLI was a fairly inexpensive way to virtually double your PC's graphic capabilities. But then came the GTX 1000 series, with GPUs powerful enough to meet the demand for ultra gaming all on their own. And since fewer and fewer games were resorting to SLI simply because they no longer needed to, fewer and fewer developers continued integrating SLI support in their games. Now this is by no means a bad thing, since developers could finally spend all of their resources on adding new features, fixing bugs, and so on, because code is a notoriously finicky thing, and enabling SLI used to take its fair share of resources out of the overall budget. But this isn't necessarily something to grieve over. Besides, even games that do support SLI don't come close to the 200% performance mark most of the time. Add to that the fact that SLI is prone to micro stuttering in alternate frame rendering mode, and you've got yourself one more reason to get a single but very powerful GPU. However, one of the worst things about SLI is that you actually have to turn it off in order to run games that don't support it. Add all this together and it's easy to see why gamers are turning away from this technology. And that's without even even mentioning the fact that two GPUs rack up a higher electric bill than just one. And as for developers, they have even less incentive to stick with SLI since DirectX 12 does not support this technology. So is SLI dead? Well, not exactly, but it's also not worth the trouble if all you want to do is just play games at ultra settings. After all, Nvidia itself seems to be phasing SLI support out more with each new model, so there's no better indicator to show that the technology is on a decline. In the most recent RTX series, only the RTX 2080 and the RTX 2080 Ti card support the NVLink required for dual SLI GPUs, but both of these graphics cards are overpowered enough on their own for most users, so NVLink definitely feels like a niche product intended solely for power users. The technology will continue to live so long as there are such power users who crave it, but as it is, SLI exists as just a shadow of the mainstream popularity that it once enjoyed. And that about does it for this video. We hope you've enjoyed it, don't forget to like and subscribe if you did, and if you've got friends who feel they need SLI in order to run Fortnite, do them a favor and share this video. We've also left a link in the description to our video where we compare AMD and NVIDIA GPUs to see which is the better pick for you in 2019, so make sure to watch that if you're still undecided. In the meantime, may your games be fun and your losses few, and as always, we'll see you next time on Gaming Scan.